Hey, first of all, I want to thank Stonecrest, man. What a phenomenal. My head is still vibrating from that song, How Great, How Great in All the Earth. I, that's an awesome song. I love that. Anyway, hey, glad y'all are here tonight. Um, if you are visiting for the first time, we want to welcome you to Remix. Uh, just give me a second here. Uh, this might seem random, but it, there's a purpose to it. Uh, out of curiosity, how many of you guys are here July 4th weekend? Just raise up your hands. Oh, no, I'm sorry. How many of you guys are not here July 4th weekend? Okay, all right. Just, I'll tell you why later, or you just figure it out. Anyway, uh, you're joining us. Uh, in, uh, we're starting, uh, launching tonight into a brand new message series titled, My Problem with Christianity. And this series was born out of a need to address some of the concerns that, uh, that the non-Christians in our lives have had. I've had conversations with some of you about this. I've had conversations with some non-Christians in my life, and, and they've kind of laid out sort of, this is my issue with your faith. This is my issue with the Christian faith. And, and so over the next four or five weeks or so, we'll work our way through uh, four main questions. The first one tonight being a question that you will probably encounter a lot, and, and that's, why do you think your way is the only way? Because at the center of the Christian faith is that we, we say that Jesus Christ says that he's the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father unless except through him, right? So we're going to address that tonight. Um, and the following week, we're going to talk about uh, why, would, uh, why does God allow suffering? Um, why does God send people to hell? And then the last week, which should be interesting, we're going to talk about um, why do Christians hate the gay community? Um, that should be nice and controversial. Please make sure you're here. Um, should be, I need some backup on that one. But tonight we want to address that first issue. Well, why is it that we think our way is the only way? Now, um, one of the most, uh, I think most per uh, pervasive thoughts that you'll encounter in society today is that, and when you speak with people, I would even argue there's some Christians who hold to this view. But, but basically the, 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 the view is that at the end of the day, all roads lead to heaven, or all roads lead to God. You, you ever come across that statement or that argument? Uh, uh, this pluralist view of God has been made even more popular by an often told story about six blind men and an elephant. You ever heard that illustration? Let, let me tell it to you. Here's how it goes. Um, the story goes that there were six blind men who went to see an elephant, and, and they were asked to describe what they saw. And so the first one approached the elephant and it, it touched its sturdy side. And, and the blind man, the first one said, oh, this creature feels like a strong wall. It's, it's a strong wall. The second man felt its tusk and disagreed with the first one. He said, no, that's not true. This creature is like a spear. The third man touched the elephant's squirming trunk and said, listen, you're both wrong. This creature is like a snake. And on and on, each six of them, each one of the six went to this animal and felt different parts and basically had different views on what it really was. And the moral of the lesson is that so often in theological wars, the disputants argue in utter ignorance about what each person means, when in reality, none of them has ever seen an elephant. Now, popular culture has hijacked that story and basically presented this view. They basically said something that though all religions have differences and walk on different paths, we are all essentially on the same journey. There's no wrong, there's no right religion because ultimately all paths lead to God. If you have not encountered that argument, you will. Give it time. Now, for most Christians who hear this, our initial reaction is what? Whoa, right? Step back. Like, wait a minute. That, that, that seems to contradict what we believe. But the truth is that the religious landscape of American society today is filled with a plethora of religious views and philosophies. Hence, it can sometimes truly be confusing when you're trying to share with a friend in your life about Jesus. And there are all these other views about God. Uh, if, if you are, let me give you the options. If you are looking for an authoritative book on spirituality, you can choose from many options. There's the Bible, the Koran, the Gita, the Gita, uh, the Book of Mormon. Uh, spiritual leaders include the Pope, the Dalai Lama, Gandhi, Muhammad, Buddha. When it comes to religious groups, there are over 1,500 denominations in the United States alone. Like, it's like a celestial fast food restaurant. Like, you can walk in any time and just, hey, let me get a, a number one Hinduism, a little bit of Islam on the side, holy Oprah, you know, like a little bit of, like, by the way, that's not a joke. Um, 
USA Today, one news article reported that concerning Oprah, that she is actually no longer just a successful talk show host worth around $1.4 billion over the past year, and this is like two years or three years ago. Winfrey, who was 52 at the time, has emerged as a spiritual leader for the new millennium, a moral voice of authority for the nation. With her television pulpit and sheer power of her persona, she has encouraged and steered audiences, mostly women, in all matters, from genocide in Rwanda to suburban spouse swapping to finding the absolute best t-shirt and oatmeal cookie. She's a really hip and materialistic Mother Teresa, one lady said. And so it's into this cacophony of religious, what I call religious hors d'oeuvres, that Christians find themselves claiming that, wait a minute, our way is the right way. Like it's into this view that we're actually saying, actually, you're all wrong. Jesus is the only way to know God. Like even just saying that sounds arrogant, doesn't it? it sounds arrogant, maybe bigoted, narrow-minded, maybe even prejudicial, depending on whom you're speaking with. By the way, those are some terms you might hear people describe you when you share your faith. So just keep that in mind that this is what you're dealing with. We live in a society where there's a number of views about who God truly is. And it's into all of this that we come and say, actually, no, Jesus. You're going to bump heads a little if you present that view. So I, I think one of the first things we need to start with is to ask the question, is it true? That, like, do all roads lead to God? Like, is it okay for me to believe what I want to believe, you believe what you believe, and at the end of the day, it doesn't matter because we're all going to end up in the same place. Like, is that okay? Because if it is, then, then we might as well just kind of tap into a little bit of everything. Well, tonight, I'm obviously going to be presenting a view for the contrary, right? Um, and, and let me start with this premise because this is really what I'm working with. Um, when it comes to that idea that all roads lead to God, uh, either somebody is right, and somebody is wrong, or everyone is wrong, but we can't all be right. Let's take a moment, swallow that one. Like Christians are either right, and everyone is wrong, or everyone else is right, and Christians are wrong, or we're all wrong, but it's intellectually dishonest to say we're all right. Like you can't, that's not a legit argument. And here's why. Um, um, though you might find some similarities in different world religions, a closer study of most world religions will reveal a contradiction in crucial areas. Hence, we can't all be right. Let me give you a few samples. Uh, for instance, Christians believe in one God in three persons. B Buddhists don't even believe in a personal God at all. Um, Hinduism believes in a divine deity. In fact, they claim to, that there are many gods. Christians and Jews believe in one God. Um, Muslims believe that there is one God, Allah is his name and Muhammad is his prophet, but Christians embrace the claim that Jesus Christ was the son of God who came to make things right between us and God. An argument, by the way, that Muslims reject. New Age thinkers argue that there are no absolute truths, everything is relative, but Judaism, Christianity, and even Islam believe in a God who holds people accountable for their beliefs and their practices. And this is just a survey of four of the world religions. Somebody is right, and somebody is wrong, or everyone is wrong, but we can't all be right. Like, there's a problem with that argument. And so what I want to do tonight with our time together is really to present you uh, uh, with, with some outrageous claims that Jesus Christ made. Like, he made some incredibly just outrageous claims about himself. And I'm choosing to focus on Jesus Christ because the life he lived, the death that he died, and, and ultimately the resurrection that, that, uh, that, that um, he, when he came back to life, um, completely, or the claims he made through his death, life, and resurrection, completely blow out of the water every other religious view out there. And, and here's why, and by the way, I, and I'm sharing this with you, and a lot of you might be thinking, well, you're preaching to the choir. I agree with you. That's great if you do. If not, let's have that conversation. But if you agree with me, don't zone me out. Uh, and here's why. Um, you will encounter someone who you need to present this case before. And so it'll be helpful for you to understand what the argument is, or, or at least why it is that you believe what you believe. Like that, I think that's a, an, an important, like, why do you believe that Jesus is the only way? And I think you need to be able to present at least some sense of credible or plausible Arguments. So, so stick with me through this, okay? It might seem a little over our heads, um, 
Um, okay, all right. A couple of people just nodded. You're fine. All right, that's good. Let's keep, let's keep moving on. Um, but, but I call Jesus' claims outrageous because during his life, Jesus never claimed to be a good teacher. Um, he didn't claim to simply be one of the prophets or one of the many options you should be considering when you're seeking out God. Jesus claimed that he was the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to God except through him. Like, he was very clear on who he was and what his mission was. He was the way, the truth, and the life. And the, now, you have to think about what he said. Like, that's pretty insane. Like, like just pause, step aside from the fact that you've known this your whole Christian life. And just think about it. He, he said he is the only way that you can know God. Like, that's fairly insane. It's been said that when Jesus spoke those words, he was either a lunatic, a, a liar, or he was, in fact, Lord of all. One of those options. So, so I think just the fact that he made that claim that he, he wasn't saying I'm one of them, he's saying I am the real deal. I think in light of that, it's worth taking some time to look at his life, or specifically his life, his death and resurrection, and come to an understanding as to why it is we believe that he is the only way that we can know God. And here's, here's one of the other premises I'm working with. If Jesus Christ isn't the Son of God, and this is important, if Jesus Christ uh, wasn't the Son of God or isn't the Son of God and simply was one of the many acceptable options, then we're fine, according to popular opinion, because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Like, if he was just one of the options and he's not really God, then, you know, at the end of the day, we all die, we all go to the same place, right? That should be fine. However, if Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the things he spoke were true, then you have more to lose if Jesus is right than if he's wrong. If he's right, then our lives are at stake. If he's wrong, then, then we'll, we'll, be, we'll be fine. But whatever your view is on Jesus Christ... One fact that you can't avoid is this, that his life here on earth, his death on his cross, and his resurrection are at, is at the center of why born-again Christians all over the globe claim that he's the only way that you can come to know God. And really, that's my goal tonight, well, or really for this first message, I want to walk through uh, 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 the, big de the big picture here is that, is that um, he, he is the only way to God because of the claims he made through his life, death, and resurrection. Um, and that was my goal tonight. However, by the time I was done preparing tonight's message, I, was, I ended up with about an hour and a half long of message. Um, it was a really long message. And so uh, since we're anti-torture here at Remix, um, I decided to cut this message in half. So I'm actually going to finish it next week. Um, so we're just going to talk about his life tonight. And, and, and what is it about his life that, that, that reflects or that makes us claim that he's the only way. And then next week, we'll talk about his death and his resurrection. Is that good? I was so happy when I finally cut it down to like 45 minutes. So let's see if I could stick with that. All right, let's do this. Let's talk about his life, okay? The life of Jesus Christ and why it is that, that in light of his life, we claim he's the way. Um, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus was born in an obscure, somewhat ghetto village to a young teenage girl who claimed that she was pregnant because the Holy Spirit came upon her. Just think about that for a second. Like, that's, like try using that excuse next time you get pregnant. Uh, don't, I'm just saying, <laughs> you know. Like, I'm just saying, just think about that, right? Um, um, it, it, he was adopted by a carpenter who raised him as his own son. I mean, had this young family lived today, they would have been on the roster for welfare. I mean, that's how ghetto, that's how poor they were. Jesus lived an incredibly not so simple life. Um, he never traveled more than 2,000 miles from his hometown. He never dated anyone, didn't go to high school, didn't go to community college, never wrote a book, never went on Oprah. Um, at age 30, he began his preaching ministry, which included healing, raising the dead, lunch dates with thieves and hookers, and daily teaching sessions with mostly uneducated fishermen. Yeah, like that was his routine. Three years into his public ministry, popular opinion changed quickly against him because he claimed to be God and because he claimed to have the power to forgive sin. That angers people. He was arrested, tortured severely after his death. He didn't even, he didn't even have a grave where they would bury him. They had to borrow a grave to bury him in. Simple life. Yet, despite that simplicity, and, over, and after 2,000 years, the cross is perhaps one of the most iconic figures today. And Jesus Christ, arguably, is perhaps the, remains the most important 
figure in human history, the most important figure in human history. I mean, more songs have been written about him, more artwork created of him, more books written about him than any other figure in human history. In fact, his life looms so large over history that we actually measure time by him today. Like time has been divided into A.D. and B.C., before Christ and after A.D., after death of Christ. By the way, there's a whole new movement right now that are really pushing to change those. They don't like the fact that we're using Christ as the one to divide history. So they're actually changing it to B.C.E. I forget what it represents, but, but there you go. Right? They're a little uncomfortable with the fact that Christ is the one that's dividing time. So that's the world we live in today. But I think what's more dramatic than the life Jesus Christ lived is the words that he spoke when he walked on earth with us. And, and I'm going to, uh, we're going to make our way through a few Bible passages. I want to encourage you to, if you have your Bible, pull it out. If you need one, there's one in the desk, uh, uh, under the chair with you. Um, if anything at all, just write down where the Bible passage is so you have something to go back to if you ever get in those conversations with your friends. Um, in the Gospel of John, chapter 8, verse 30, uh, 48, Jesus gets in an argument with the religious leaders of his day about his true identity. And in that account, we really come face to face with some of the outrageous claims he made about his life and his divinity. So, John chapter 8, I'm sorry, John chapter 8, verse 48. Actually, let's, let's start in 52. So prior, are, are you guys with me? All right. So prior to verse 52, he'd been arguing with religious leaders about his true identity. By the time we get to verse 52, this argument is about to hit a crescendo. Um, Jesus had just made the statement that only through faith in him would people have eternal life. And obviously this angers the religious leaders. Verse 52, they respond to him. They said to him, dude, now we know you are possessed by a demon. <laughs> They think Jesus is demon possessed because of his claims. Even Abraham and the prophets died. But here you are saying anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. What are you greater than our father Abraham? He died and so did the prophets. Who do you think you are? Verse 54. Jesus answered, listen, if I was looking to glorify myself, it doesn't count. But it's my father who will glorify me. You say that he is our God, but you don't even know him. I know him, and if I said otherwise, I would be a great liar as you. But I do know him, and I obey him. Verse 56, your father Abraham rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it, and he was glad. At this point, people are getting, I mean, they're just getting, they're, they're losing their minds. The people said, well, well, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you've seen Abraham? And Jesus answered them and said, I tell you the truth. Here we go. Before Abraham even was born, was even born, I am. At that point, he lost it. Verse 59, well, they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. Now, um, let's, let's make our way through that, because that's a, that's a significant statement that Jesus made. I mean, he, he, obviously, something about that statement angered them. Um, to our English ears, when we hear the words, before Abram was, I am, it sounds like bad grammar, right? Like, okay, well, what's up with that? Um, but his listeners knew exactly what he meant when he said that. Those words are really a reference or an allusion to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses appears before God, and, and God sends Moses to go release the Israelites from Egypt, and Moses basically says to God, that's awesome, but, but who should I tell him sent me? Like, what's your name? And God replies in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, God says, I am who I am. Tell the Israelites that I am has sent you. Like, tell him that this is the God that's sent you. Now, that phrase is an incredibly holy phrase, at least for, for Israelites, for the Jews, because it, it was the very name of God. They wouldn't even write it down. They, they would avoid using consonants, or they only wrote down the consonants, which is where we get the word Yahweh from. Like, it was an incredible, they didn't even speak it. It was such a revered word that they were afraid to speak it out in public. They only wrote down the consonants. And so... Jesus, knowing that story, knowing that they knew that story, uses the word I am to reference himself when they ask him who he was. So, so he was in essence, right, because you will encounter people who will say that he was a good teacher, he was a great prophet, but when you start to go into the realm of divinity, whew, that's just too much. But, but here he makes it clear as to who he is. I mean, he was in essence claiming 
a sort of transcendence over time and space that could only be true of God. He was claiming not only to be eternal, but also the same God who appeared to Moses in the desert. Now, now do you see why they picked up stones to try and kill him? And by the way, when it says they pick up stones, don't pick your little pebble that you flip across. The, like, these were like large rocks. Like, like it was intent, the rocks that they picked up was intended to do one thing, kill you. So just think about how big a rock is to, to kill a man. They were, but because it wasn't his time, he, he slipped out from them. Christ referenced himself. He, he put himself on par with God. That's outrageous. Like, like, he's either a lunatic or a liar or he's Lord of all. And we'll visit those two views of whether he was a lunatic or a liar. Uh, by the way, that account is not the only occasion where he claimed to be divine. In John chapter 14, verse 9, Jesus says, Anyone who has seen me has seen God the Father. In John chapter 14, verse 6, he says again, same thing I've quoted, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. And no man can come to God the Father except through me. And I tell you what, he backed up those claims on various occasions through his healings, his miracles, whether it was raising the dead, casting out demons, walking on water, or turning water to wine. He, he, he spoke it many times, making people know that, listen, I'm not just a man, I'm divinity. And he backed it up by doing miracles and healings, things that astounded people. So, here's the deal. You can love him and worship him, or, or you can hate him, despise him, reject him, but the life that Jesus lived and the words he spoke does not give us the option of viewing him simply as a mere man or as a good teacher. He has not left that option open to us. You're really enjoying that, aren't you? <laughs> He's yawning right. Ready to go. Up top. No? Okay. All right. We'll keep going. We'll keep going. C.S. Lewis. You guys know who C.S. Lewis is? Um, author of the um, Narnia Chronicles. Um, he wrote screw tape letters. Um, in one of his books titled Mere Christianity, he says this concerning Jesus, and he's writing specifically to people who say, well, he was good, but he wasn't really... Here's what C.S. Lewis writes. C.S. says, I I'm trying here to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus, which is that I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claims to be God. C.S. Lewis says, listen, that's one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he's a poached egg or else he would be the devil of hell. You make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He hasn't left that open to us. He never intended to. You know, when you read through the Gospels and you read through the life of Jesus Christ, all he did and all he said, you, you can't miss the fact that Jesus continually reiterated, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. He continually put himself on par with God. Being the son of God, he was relating as being the, he, he was basically saying he was divine. He was no ordinary man. He says he's the only way through which humanity can gain access to God so that we can be reconciled into our relationship with God. And here's the great thing. What Jesus set in place is not a works-based system. Arguably, every other religion that presents himself has a set of rules and regulations that you have to follow in order for you to be right to get in touch with the deity that they call deity or whoever they call God. Christianity is the only religion that says that. Christianity is the only religion that says God says, listen, where you are, I'm coming to you. Like you didn't have to do anything to earn it other than faith in Christ. Outrageous claims. It's not a workspace system, it's a grace-based system. Now, let, let's, let's, let's talk about the opposing views, at least the ones about being a lunatic and a liar, because I think in fairness to them, um, they've raised those issues. And, and one obviously is that he, you know, the, the argument is that, well, it's likely that Jesus was a little mentally loose to say the things he did. 
the other argument is that he was a con artist. He was a, he was a liar. Let's examine both of them. Um, James Emery White um, wrote a book called The Search for the Spiritual. Matter of fact, in the lobby, we have books we're selling. It's right there if you want to get it. Great book. I use that a lot for the, to help me prep for this series. Actually, I used another great book. Um, and once again, these resources are, 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 are um, great tools. Um, the Reason for God by Tim Keller, Timothy Keller. Great book. Great book. A um, little head heavy, but it, it's really good. Anyway, in James... Emery White's book, uh, The Search of the Spiritual, he debunks that illness or that mental illness myth. Here's what he writes. He says, in most cases of severe psychological disorder, the background of the person points to a history of mental illness. Nothing in the historical record of the life of Jesus Christ reveals any of the classic manifestations of mental in illness, such as the inability to relate to the real world or inadequacy to a personal or inadequacy in personal relationships or deficiencies in verbal skills. Like, I mean, when you think about the mental illness argument, it really is a ridiculous argument. I'm sorry if that sounds like it's a ridiculous argument. Um, it's one thing to claim that Jesus Christ might have been personally insane, but if that's true, how do you explain the mental state of thousands of his followers? So you're saying every one of them was mental, mentally insane. Like, how do you explain not only the conversion of everyday folks who left their lives, their careers, and their families to to follow him, not only those guys, but how do you explain the conversion of well-respected, educated religious scholars during his day who put their faith in him? Men like Nicodemus, men like Joseph of Arimathea. I mean, these were men that were known, respected. Like, how do you explain their overnight conversion? I mean, if Jesus was a lunatic and if his divinity was some sort of elaborate plot that he schemed in his mind, how do you explain the miracles? How do you explain his ability to walk on water, surf without a board? How do you explain his ability to scare the life out of demons? How do you explain his ability to feed 12,000 people with two fish burgers? Like, how do, you, how do you explain how he was able to ruin a funeral by bringing the dead back to life? I mean, that just messes up your day, right? <laughs> Pay for the coffin already. I'm going to return it now. I mean, I could go on. Like, like the argument falls on its face. He was mentally sound. The other argument against his divinity is that, what, he, he was a con artist, he was a con man, right? A liar. So let's examine that, that argument also. Um, you know, we live in a culture today where um, discipline in the home is kind of questioned. I mean, you got Dyfus. I mean, if you look at your kid the wrong way, they'll call Dyfus on you. Um, but I grew up in a different culture. I don't know, um, <laughs> I don't know how to present that. I don't know if you've ever been beaten with a cane or flogged um, with whips, um, but that, that's the culture I, I grew up in and it was, it was permissible. I grew up in Nigeria. I was born here, but grew up in Nigeria. Um, and anyway, I tell you that to say this. In light of the pain that I've encountered in my life after being beaten, um, one thing I can tell you for certain is this, that pain will make you do and admit to some things. Like pain will make you do and admit the things you didn't even know you did. Without, without going into the gory details that I went through, I have on a number of occasions admitted my wrongdoings under the influence of a leather belt. Let's leave it at that. Uh, oh, by the way, not just me. I mean, on a few occasions, I've even admitted to things I didn't do just because the pain was so much. I went to boarding school, by the way. Don't think my parents are crazy. I went to boarding school in Nigeria, right? And, and that was just the norm. I mean, depending on how old you are in here, some of you guys have uh, known the, the pains of being on the other end of a leather belt. Okay, two of you guys, that's fine. I'm glad you grew up in the, in the 90s. Um, and a number of my friends have actually gone through, through it also. Um, but I tell you that to make the, pain, the point that it, it, pain will make you admit to things that no matter how much you're hot, you will admit it. Um, Jesus had it much worse than I did in boarding school. He was arrested. He was mocked. He was spat on, beaten, pounded. I mean, if you need descriptions, uh, if you need further details, rent Passion of the Christ tonight. You get an idea of what I'm talking about. On a few occasions, he was offered the chance to renounce all his belief to ease the pain, but not once, despite all the pain he went through, did he ever deny his deity. By the way, my pain happened over the course of seven years. Jesus encountered all of this one night. 
Here's something you should know about liars and con artists. Like, like at the heart of their scheme is selfishness. Like, like people who are liars who make up these elaborate plots to make themselves look better than they really are, at the heart of their argument is just selfishness. They are primarily concerned about self-preservation. They will deceive people and tell lies until their deception costs them more than they can gain. If telling the truth will keep a con artist from having a 10-inch nail driven into the flesh of his hands, he will admit everything he did wrong and tattletale on everyone else. Because it's about self-preservation. But once again, despite all the opportunities that Jesus Christ was given, tortured, beaten, even, even Pontius Pilate came up to him and said, listen, I'll, I'll, I'll let you go. Just, just tell me what the real deal is. And, and even then, he kept claiming that he was, in fact, the Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus never renounced his claims that he was, in fact, the Son of God and that only through him could we be saved. Now, that's just one argument. The life he lived, the words he spoke, and the example he set testify to the fact that he was, in fact, who he said he was, the Son of God through whom we might be saved. And the question that you and I and the people in our lives will have to encounter or deal with at that point, or, or the question every spiritual seeker has to answer is this, how are you going to respond to his invitation? In light of whom he said he is, and in light of the fact that if he's right, you have more to lose than if he's wrong. Like, that's what you need to respond to. I mean, ignoring for a second, because many times when you speak with non-Christians, one of the continual arguments they'll bring up is, well, Christians are judgmental. Well, Christians have done this. And you know what? Let's be honest. A lot of us have messed up. I mean, just some of us are idiots. And we've, 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 we've lived a life in the public eye that's caused people to question who Christ really is. And we just need to be honest with that. I think one of your best arguments in talking with non-Christians in your life is to admit to it. Don't try and defend Christianity. Admit to it. Yes, we've messed up. But here's the deal. You always point them back to Jesus Christ. They'll find fault with you. They'll find fault with the church. They'll find fault with Christians. But when they examine the life of Jesus Christ, it never fails. His life gives evidence. His words, his life, the example he set, testifies to the fact that he is, was, who he said he is. So what are you going to do with that? Let's pray.